Uh, so I grew up here in Palo Alto. Uh, I, I attended uh, Duvenek and Jordan and Pali. Uh, at Pali, I was a senior class president. And I was a goalie on the soccer team and a couple of other things. I moved to Atlanta uh, at first. I went to Emory University for a year, transferred up to Georgetown University uh, for soft after my freshman year. Um, after college, I was a community organizer on political campaigns in South Dakota and Louisiana and Kentucky. Uh, and back to South Dakota, um, and working on, on U mainly U.S. Senate races and a governor's race. I came back to California for law school. Uh, I went to the University of Southern California. I served on the law review for two years. I uh, was in student government the whole time there, ended up being president of the student body, um, and was just very engaged in, in the law school community, which was, I felt like that was 50% of law school. Half of it was academic, and the other half was, you know, really getting to know all of my classmates. Um, I moved back home uh, to practice law. I was a corporate attorney in the Silicon Valley office of Latham and Watkins for about three years, uh, where I worked with uh, the whole gamut of corporate clients, from startup companies that were just looking for their first round of financing or even just getting incorporated, to companies that were going public uh, through the IPO process and, and public company representation. I also had a, a really great opportunity to work with a lot of pro bono clients who tended to be my favorite clients. Um, and that included um, you know, women, uh, immigrants who were seeking legal permanent resident status under the Vi Violence Against Women Act. Uh, I represented a, a client who was a young man from uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo who was seeking political asylum. His father was a political activist. In, the, in Kinshasa and had been assassinated. Um, and, I, and I worked with a, a nonprofit pro bono client called Spark uh, that provides uh, community mentorships for at risk middle school students in underprivileged um, regions. So when I started working with them, they were mainly based in the Bay Area and were just opening up in LA. Since then, they've opened up in Chicago and are in the process of opening up in Philadelphia, so becoming a real nationwide nonprofit. And it was, that was a really fun experience for me. Um, during that time, and, and probably to my employer's chagrin, I was also really getting involved in the community. Um, so I served on the campaign committee for the Measure A parcel tax measure in 2010. I was appointed to uh, independent monitoring committee for the Clean Safe Creeks and Natural Flood Protection Program, uh, which is part of the Santa Clara Valley Water District. It's a bit of a mouthful, and we haven't figured out how to condense that. Um, but so it's an oversight committee for that program. And then um, in late 2010, I was appointed to the Infrastructure Blue Ribbon Commission um, here in the city. I'm also on the advisory board of an organization called the New Leaders Council uh, for their Silicon Valley chapter. Uh, and it's a nonprofit that tries to bring people together, from di bring younger people together from diverse community or diverse backgrounds um, to give them the skills necessary to become leaders in their community, whether that's um, privately, uh, through fundraising measures for teachers or for people who want to run for office. It kind of runs the gamut. Um, I left Latham at the end of last year, at the end of 2011, and I'm now of counsel to a, a smaller law firm called Marino Yebri. Uh, they're an LA-based firm, and I'm the Northern California corporate counsel. Um, and now I'm running for, for city council as well. You weren't doing it now, huh? No, no, I was bored on Monday nights. So. So how would your election to the city council make a difference? How would you fit in with this council? What unique qualities would you bring um, uh, to, the, to the group of nine that's up there? Sure. Um, well, I think, you know, unfortunately, with Sid and Yahweh deciding not to run for re-election, um, that, that leaves a bit of a void in terms of someone representing the younger kind of generation in Palo Alto. 55% of Palo Altans are 44 years or younger. Um, and and uh, with the way things stand with Sidney Yahweh not running for re-election, nobody on the council would be younger than, I think, 49. Um, so, you know, I, I bring that perspective uh, to discussions and, and deliberations. I'm also uh, a Palo Alto native, uh, which is kind of unique. I grew up here, wasn't born here. I was born in Dallas and, and moved here when we were four, or when I was not quite four. Uh, but grew up here, moved away for 10 years, and, and you know, lived in a lot of very different communities from D.C. to, you know, the town of 3,000 people in South Dakota. Um, and, and then chose to move back here, um, you know, because I loved growing up here and, and 
want my kids that I don't yet have to eventually have hopefully similar experiences. Um, so, you know, and then as an attorney, that's not something, there are a couple of other attorneys on, on council, but I never think that's a bad deal when you're, um, you know, making ordinances. Um, yeah. Okay. Plus, sorry, uh, you know, my experience on the Infrastructure Commission where, you know, what we did was really just dive into this issue of, of the um, inadequacies of our current infrastructure assets. And that's something that the council is going to be dealing with a lot over the next couple of years. I think it was wise of the council, um, you know, initially they were going to try to accomplish or, or kind of tackle this issue in 2012 and then quickly realized that that's way too accelerated of a time frame. Um, and so that's something where I think um, having gone, you know, having been a member of the IBRIC, um, it, I kind of bring a depth of knowledge uh, about some of those issues and some of the possibility. I mean, the, the great thing about it is the opportunities that we have uh, moving forward and just making sure that we really consider all of them uh, and, and, you know, uh, set Palo, Palo Alto up for, for decades to come. So are you um, in full agreement with the recommendations of the infrastructure um, task force? Um, and and what, how would you describe your own views of the infrastructure priorities? Sure. There, we, had, we had 150 pages of, of recommendations, so I, I wouldn't want to say that I'm in full agreement with everyone. <laughs> Um, but I'm, I'm definitely in agreement, you know, with the, the goals um, as a whole. Um, specifically, uh, you know, I, I think that I was happy to see the council um, adopt our recommendation to increase current infra infrastructure spending by $2.2 .2 million a year. And I think that's something that we need to make sure stays that way so that we don't slide back into uh, the problem that we're currently in. Um, the infrastructure management system, which is something that didn't, hasn't gotten as much kind of attention because it's pretty nuanced um, and, and technical, um, but this creating a system, an infrastructure management system uh, that tracks all of our infrastructure assets and can create a one-page synopsis that the council and that senior staff can use to make sure that we're keeping up with our obligations in terms of our infrastructure assets is incredibly important. Uh, I definitely think we need a new public safety building. I definitely think that we need to rebuild the two new firehouses. Those were, you know, the public safety building was built in 1970 and was borderline obsolete when they moved in. Um, and the public and the and the two new firehouses, the two new firehouses were, were built, I think, in the 50s, either 50s or early 60s, when fire trucks were much smaller than they are now, and when we, you know, we weren't aware of the dangers of. Um, our, our firemen sleeping so close to the, the toxic fumes from the, the fire engines and, and all sorts of other, and they're seismically unstable. So um, those I agree with. Um, I you think- You would put the public safety building at the, at the top of the list in terms of infrastructure needs for the city? Um, yes, I, I mean, I think we have a lot of top needs, um, but I think that the public safety building is absolutely one. Uh, you know, to me, it's, it's a no brainer. I know that People, you know, other folks say, well, we shouldn't build a Taj Mahal to public safety. Or people say we, you know, compensate our public safety officers too much and they don't deserve a public safety building. It has nothing to do with them. Uh, it has to do with us as Palo Altans. And do we want to have access to a full set of public safety services if, and, and I'd say when, there's another major earthquake in the area? Um, or, or do we want the public safety building, the current public safety building that's seismically unfit, to be shuttered for, for safety concerns, including the emergency operations center that's in the basement of that building. Um, and you know, I was at Quakeville, uh, the emergency preparedness exercise this weekend, and they had the, mer the mobile emergency operations center out there. And, and I went and I was talking with one of the policemen that was in there, and he didn't know who I was or, or that I was running for office. And you know, I said, can this, you know, we're talking about the functionalities of the MEOC, the Mobile Emergency Operations Center, versus the, the standalone one. And it's clear that, you know, that can get us by in a crisis, um, but that's not a long term solution. And it doesn't provide us the same functionality as the, the permanent one. And, and that's, um, you know, yes. So, so that's something that I feel pretty strongly about. One of the recommendations of the infrastructure group was. Um, to not renew the lease at Coverly, yep. the school district. Um, do you support that recommendation? And as a council member, how would you uh, 
bring that issue to the public and for resolution? Sure. So that was, you know, easily the most controversial thing that was that was said in the report. Um, and and in hindsight, you know, maybe we shouldn't have had that be in the report. We initially we were instructed not to look at Coverly, and then midway through we're, we're told to look at Coverly, and so we kind of, <coughs> um, you know, I don't want to use the word scrambled, but we, we rushed to, to come up with a recommendation. I think the Coverly lease agreement is a an perfect example of the city and the school district working together to address an area of need for the, for the you know, betterment of the entire community, right? 25 years ago when the lease was entered into, um, the school age population was at a low, the revenue in the school district was, was falling short, the school district was selling off school sites um, to raise revenue, and, and as we all know, once you sell off a school site and it's developed on, it's gone forever. Uh, and, and there were folks in the community who had the foresight to say, wait a second, you know, our school age, our, 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 our student population will eventually rise again, and let's make sure that they have, um, you know, that, that we maintain enough school sites to, to be able to handle that. Um, that's not the case anymore. The, the school age population is, is, I think, near or at a high. Uh, the financial situation of the city isn't nearly as strong as it was 25 years ago. Um, the, the school district has already uh, you know, begun purchasing sites for additional schools. They're currently renting out sites to private schools that they could turn into to school sites. So when I look at the Coverly lease, I look at three different things. There's the lease of Coverly for about $4 million a year. Uh, for the, the the playing fields and the the dance studios and the you know all, all coverly there's the covenant not to develop where the city is paying the school district about 1.8 million dollars a year um, to compensate the school district so the school doesn't develop on its current sites which and then there's um, about a million dollars I think for the the city to rent um, child care sites at I think a dozen schools, and I think that's a great thing because we have a uh, we don't have enough affordable childcare in the city. Um, I'm okay with with, and and we're at a place where uh, we're now at the stage where there are two five year uh, renewal terms for the the whole thing. Um, I'm okay with with the city continuing to. I, th I think it makes sense for the city to continue to lease Coverly, um, you know, for the for the four million dollar lease. Uh, I definitely think that we should continue to um, rent the, the school sites for childcare uh, for a million dollars. I don't think we should continue the, the covenant not to develop. I think that that um, is, is something that's clearly obsolete and, and you know, as the school district is, is looking to buy sites um, and has stated that um, you know, they, they're looking now at, at finding another site for a, a fourth middle school. Um, I was under the impression that we were maintaining Coverly this way so that when the city or when the school district needed additional school sites, Coverly would be that additional school site. Um, and, and that's why the city's paid the school district, I think, upwards of almost $175 million over the last 25 years, um, you know, to, to maintain Coverly. I'd like to see it be a 10-year renewal. Uh, this, the school district wants... That you, I, took a step back and I tried to look at what do each of the parties want. And the school district wants to continue to receive revenue from the city and they want flexibility. The city wants certainty and, and would like to stop paying so much money to the school district. Um, and I think community members, the, you know, the, at least the vast majority of the ones that I've spoken to, want some certainty also. Um, and if we just do it for another five year term, we're gonna be having these same conversations five years from now. The school district seemed to indicate that they didn't kind of, they didn't set anything in stone, but they said, you, you know, we might need the school site again sometime in the early 2020s um, for a school. So let's have the lease run until then and at least have the 10 year certainty so that we can also start making some decent renovations to Coverly, uh, which nobody's willing to do at this point when nobody knows who's gonna control it five years from now. I'd also like to see the city seriously consider doing something permanent on its eight acres. You know, the city owns eight acres, the school district owns 27 acres. And I think that um, there are 
certain parts of, of Coverly that are really underutilized right now that if we were to say, okay, we're gonna do something permanent with our eight acres, we could put a pretty amazing community center, for instance, on that eight acres and, and have a new building that's um, you know, much more, um, that has much more you know, functionality than what's currently there. What did you think about the Foothill College um, proposal um, a couple years ago to take the city-owned um, portion and develop that into its own um, permanent middle field campus instead of I, I, you know, I, I think that would have been a great opportunity for the city and, and, and for Foothill. And this school district has a, um, a, a right of first refusal uh, in, the, in the lease. And so, um, you know, they ended up not exercising that because they just said, hey, we want that. And therefore, the city kind of backtracked and, and Foothill's now finding a, a, a different site. Um, but I think that that would have been a pretty, pretty good use of those eight acres. And a, and a pretty good opportunity for the city. So is the way you look at the, um, at, at the lease is as a charitable act by the city to the school district? Or do you look at, at it as um, rental of space that the city is making good use of and that it's worth the different the, the delta between what we're collecting in rent and what we're paying in rent? Sure. Um, I think that I, I view it as the latter. I view it as, as a, a good rental for the city to, to provide benefits to the community. So you've got the, the field spaces, you've got the dance studios, you've got the, the reading room and, and the, the art studios. Um, I think on the whole, it's a good, it, it, it coverly provides a good benefit to the community um, and, and that makes it worth it for the the $4 million lease. Um, I think that the city can probably do it. I think that the city needs to do a better job of, there's some, there might be some parts of Coverly that, that aren't providing the, the community benefit that it should. Um, and so, you know, they're getting subsidized rent um, and, and maybe the city isn't getting enough benefit out of it. And I think that that's something that we should look at um, to, to make sure, um, you know, the city is getting its benefit. Um, but I don't necessarily, at this point, I look at the $1.8 million covenant not to develop as a, as a, as a charitable act um, because it's no longer needed. No longer a risk of that yeah. development. Yeah. Um, so, so that's why I don't think that it makes sense to continue with that. Um, but no, I think Coverly as a whole definitely um, adds a ton of value to the community. I, I used to play baseball there and soccer there. And, mm -hmm. But given that the, the rent that the city's receiving is, is barely, if it even is, covering the cost of maintenance of the site and the actual operating costs, and it's really not covering any part of the lease payments to the school district, that's a, that's a big price we're paying as a, as a city um, in, in foreclosing other ways to spend that, that money and maintain that facility for the benefit of a relative few number of people. Um, and, and so I, get, I mean, that's the analysis that would have to be done is how many people and how many Palo Altans are benefiting um, from, from use of the site. And I think that um, there are a lot that are um, from people who use the fields to people who use the, the dance studios and, and the different classrooms and, and all the different services that are provided there. I think that there are probably areas, I mean, I do think there are, there are areas where we could probably improve it. Um, and, and um, you know, we shouldn't just, uh, th there needs to be some oversight every couple of years to make sure that the city is getting the benefit for, and, and yes, we're, I think we're receiving about a quarter on the dollar uh, in rent in terms of what we're renting it for and, and how much we're renting it out for. Um, and that's something that, you know, that's one of the things that a city does is, is provide programs to its residents. We just need to make sure that the residents are actually getting the benefit. I want to shift gears to um, development issues and in particular some of these major proposals that are um, before the city um, and the use of the PC zone which has become sort of the preferred method of any major development in the community right now. Yeah. Um, and we've got, uh, we've, we've just approved um, the gateway project on Lytton, mm -hmm. which um, came in as a <clears throat> PC zone. And we've got, of course, the Ariaga proposal for 27 University. And we've got this proposal that um, J. Paul. Uh, we get a, a public safety building built for us in exchange for um, uh, much greater development rights for the developer. 
Um, what concerns do you have about this process and what changes would you advocate for how these kinds of uh, proposals uh, utilizing the PC zone get, get handled by the city? So one of the big concerns that I have is exactly what you mentioned, which is it's become the preferred method for developers. And I think that um, that's disconcerting to me, that that's become the default um, kind of avenue that, that developers think is just um, an option. Uh, and, and I think that the city council needs to make sure um, th that PC zoning, you know, is is really the exception to the rule and doesn't become the rule. Uh, I, I do think that there are times when when it can be um, when, where it makes sense, um, but I'm worried by the, there have been a lot of, of PC proposals over the last month, let alone a couple of years, um, and and that um, that that concerns me. Um, well, isn't the horse out of the barn on that one, though? I mean, this, how does the council change its, its approach uh, to discourage PC applications? Reject an application that it doesn't think is, is worthy of PC status. Um, well, the, they, they could easily do that. Mm -hmm. You have to persuade a majority of your colleagues that, that it's not. Sure. Um, and so is that the solution, to just have the debate more vigorously and hopefully hopefully persuade others that those benefits aren't good enough? Or is some reform actually needed of the actual public benefit criteria, which really doesn't exist? Yes. Uh, so I mean, I, th I think both things make sense. I mean, I think that, that we do need, I, I think that folks need to be aware that, that, you know, receiving PC zoning designation isn't a given. Um, and I also think that we need to reform the process. And some of the reforms, to answer your initial question, that we need are, one is making sure that the public's really getting the benefit that is negotiated throughout this process. So there have been a lot of um, complaints uh, that you know, the council has, has extracted be public benefits from developers. And then when you look five years later and the development's done, the public benefit doesn't exist. Um, and so we need to do a much better job of, of you know, oversight and, and making sure both right after the project is developed and also five and 10 years down the road that some of these public benefits like open spaces don't just become outdoor seating for restaurants. Um, so we need to do a better job of that. And, and you know, the council needs to make that clear to staff and staff needs to create a, a process for um, you know, having some oversight on, on that. We also, I'd love to see us find a way to uh, quantify the benefit, um, both the public benefit and um, to the extent possible, the, the benefit to the developer of being able to exceed the, the zoning regulations um, and then try to define some sort of, not hard equation, but at least you know, have a better idea for what um, is necessary for the community to receive in exchange for the approval of the PC status uh, in, in the project. Because right now, um, that doesn't really seem to exist, and that's scary for, for the public, right? When they never have, you know, when, when there's no sort of, um, you know, set, not expectations, but, but, you know, where the public can't be confident that they're really gonna achieve something of, of real tangible public benefit in exchange for dramatically increased development. Are you familiar enough with some of the more recent PC uh, zone approvals to be able to say whether you would have voted against any of them? I'm thinking of the JJNF market PC, the Edgewood PC, the Alma Plaza PC, the Gateway PC. Uh, not as much. Uh, no. Uh, no, I mean, not enough to be to be honest. Not enough to say. You know, not enough to know exactly what went into each decision and. and you know, be able to say confidently that I would have or would not have rejected it. Um, you know, I, I think the Alma Plaza project is serving as a bellwether to everybody um, for what can go wrong um, and, and for why, you know, and, and for how the process has gotten out of hand a little bit as the project goes up um, and, and as the development's being completed. But interestingly uh, enough, I mean, your earlier comment that the council just needs to say no to these PCs, that's exactly what occurred in, in, the, in the park, in the in the portion of the development proposal of Alma Plaza that became so controversial, council dug in and said, "No, we're not going to. We're not going to accept this." That caused delays. The developer had to keep returning with new plans. Ultimately, a plan was approved, but it was it was that resistance to accepting a plan that that seemed out of out of 
what the, this community needed or wanted mm -hmm. that led to that. But, but now we've got two big proposals that, that I wonder if, if, especially as a lawyer, with how you address the, the perceived conflict of interest that exists, where in both cases, the, the public safety building one and the Ariaga proposal that includes various public benefits, where the city staff has essentially now become um, advocates for the proposals and is working hand in hand with the developer to um, tailor those proposals to win council approval. Mm -hmm. um, where, how does the public interest get sorted out in that process? So, so one way, uh, at least in regards to the Ariaga proposal, is, is through the ballot, uh, you know, and the fact that they are taking a couple of the, the pieces of, of the proposal to the public for a vote, I think at some point in, in possibly March of 2013, um, to approve uh, the development on some of the parkland and also the, I think it's the, the redesignated, the creating a new zone for, for the project. So that's, I mean, that's a direct way, right, that the public gets to, to weigh in. And, and but should staff be an advocate at that, prior to that stage? Um, it's a good question. Um, you know, I, I think that regardless of whether or not staff's an advocate, it's the city council's job to be, to, to, you know, advocate on by, or be a representative of the city. Uh, and not necessarily go along, or definitely not go along with staff's recommendation if, if they don't think that, that it's a good recommendation. And, you know, an example of that was the Animal Services Center, uh, where staff recommended closing it down, um, which I think is, is the, what staff should have done. Um, and the, the community rose up and said, no, you know, this, this is something that we value, and, and here are some creative solutions to solve the problem. And the council took staff's recommendation and the community's buy-in and made their decision based on that. And, and I, you know, I think that's exactly how this process should work. Um, you know, yeah, it probably makes me a little bit uncomfortable that, that staff is advocating on behalf of, of um, private developer projects. That, you know, I'd rather see staff offer up a, a, a more um, objective analysis of the, of the proposal. Um, but regardless, you know, city council has got to be aware of that and, and not take that into account when they make their decision. So I realize it's a little unfair to ask you for, for your position on the Ariaga proposal since it's just emerging. Sure. But, but I wonder um, how you would go about weighing the size, height, traffic impacts um, of a proposal of that scale where apparently uh, the developer is saying, I'm not going any smaller than this than this square footage mm -hmm. against the public benefits that have been identified. How, uh, how, how are you going to, other than letting the voters say what they think of this in whatever form it comes to them, how are you as a council member going to balance those? Uh, I mean, that's the, the crux of what they've got to do, right? And, and I think... Um, Ariaga again. Yeah, I mean, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm, I can't come out as in favor or against a proposal that you know the details are just starting to emerge as of one o'clock last right. this morning. Um, but um, of course, the developer is saying that that this is that he's not budging. Um, that's you know, it's it's negotiating. In the, you know, all of this are negotiations, and I think it's important for the council to be aware of that. That. Um, you know, just because somebody says they won't budge doesn't mean they won't budge. And, and it's in that, you know, somebody doesn't get as successful as, as this um, uh, uh, applicant has become without being good at, at negotiating. Um, so, I, I, you know, I don't think that the council should be afraid to push back um, on the size of the development. I think that um, it's, it's imperative that we look at the the negative impacts of the development, so the, the increased traffic, and we have to take into account, um, you know, the, the increased jobs, and, and does that change housing allocations, um, you know, under ABAG, and, and um, the increased use of city services. I mean, these are all things that must be taken into account. Um, and, and also, having a robust dialogue with the community um, to, to decide, is this something that uh, they want. I mean, the benefits of this project do seem pretty great, uh, but the pro uh, that's not a great way of putting it. 
Um, it's a huge project on every level. The benefits are huge. The project is huge. The development is huge. And, and um, just because somebody's offering us a ton of money doesn't mean that the project's a good idea. Um, and we've got to look at that first. Um, Does it matter at all to you that um, Ariaga is going to gift this, this, these buildings to Stanford? No. So that the philanthropic aspect of this, other than the public benefits that any developer would be required to offer under this type of project, um, doesn't doesn't enter into this from your standpoint? No. Okay. Yeah.